First at five, Mayor Ron Nuremberg and County Commissioner Tommy Calvert joining the call to keep those monitored for the coronavirus in quarantine at Joint Base San Antonio Lackland. Yesterday, we told you about Judge Nelson Wolf writing a letter to Congressman Chip Roy asking him to recommend the Department of Defense stop transferring patients out of Lackland to anywhere else in San Antonio. In a separate letter addressed to Secretary of Defense Mark Esper, Tommy Calvert says in part, quote, having JBSA Lackland house these victims also takes away the command and control structure the civilian leadership at the state and local level are accustomed to. If the civilian leadership is not able to reduce vectors for the spread of the disease through isolated facilities that are away from the civilian population, then I recommend that JBSA Lackland be decommissioned as a U.S. quarantine facility because the potential for the spread of the disease into the community is too great, end quote. Mayor Ron Nuremberg also commenting on the coronavirus concerns today. Our challenge is uh, we want to make sure that we have uh, a, a better protocol with regard to the travelers at, at the uh, Lackland facility and making sure they're not unnecessarily transporting when they're not positive so we don't overwhelm local and state facilities. Transparency in all of this also a concern. Yesterday, the Texas state health officials said the Texas Center for Infectious Disease on the south side is being used for evacuees with either symptoms of the coronavirus or confirmed cases. They would not say how many patients were being treated there right now what they were being treated for, and if anyone else has tested positive. The only thing they have said publicly is evacuees are there. Ultimate government transparency, this is not. We do know one person remains in isolation at Methodist Tech Hospital, Texan. We're monitoring any changes with the coronavirus here in San Antonio and will continue providing updates on air and online as they come in. Meantime, an update on an ongoing story. A man is dead after police say he set his neighbor's car on fire, barricaded himself inside a home and threw a Molotov cocktail at police officers. We're now working to learn that man's name, but police say the standoff started around 10 in the morning when firefighters were called to the home at the corner of Litchfield and Stonehaven on the northwest side. It all came to an end, though, at around 3 this afternoon. Stephanie Cerner reports the argument that started it all actually happened much, much earlier. Negotiators working to get a 29 year old man out of the house after police say he set his neighbor's SUV on fire. Uh, at one point he threw a Molotov cocktail out the, out the balcony at police officers. And at that point we declared a barricade suspect uh, SWAT got to the scene. Uh, at, at some point thereafter, he set his upstairs on fire. Chief Floyd McManus said the 29 year old and his neighbor had been arguing all night and that the suspect walked across to his neighbor's house, first breaking the windows on the SUV before he set it on fire. The big challenges we had in a situation like this is trying to apply water when there's a chance of firefighters getting shot. So we're trying to apply water from the cover of the PD vehicles and to protect exposure, so it's a huge challenge for us. When police made it inside, they found the 29-year-old man's body. And right now, it's not clear how that 29-year-old man died, if it was smoke inhalation or if he shot himself. Police tell us, though, that he lived in this house with his parents. However, his parents were not home when all this happened. We are live on the city's northwest side. Stephanie Cerna, Case at 12 News. Thank you, Stephanie. A three year old beaten to death allegedly at the hands of his mother's boyfriend. Three weeks after Christian Paz died, we've learned his two older siblings who reportedly witnessed the beating have been taken from their mother's custody. In a hearing today, a judge granted custody to the mother's parents. The suspect, 29 year old Logan Harville, was arrested on a charge of injury to a child late last month. He currently remains behind bars. Harville accused of abusing all three children. And on January 27th, that abuse allegedly took Paz's life. Attorneys representing Paz's two older siblings say while their mother has not been charged in this case, she knew what was happening. Mom was at work. She came home. She knew the kids got beaten up. 
the older brother was bleeding when she came home. She patched up the blood and left back to go to work. And that's when the three-year-old got murdered. The mother has been granted supervised visits three times a month. It's unclear whether she will face charges ultimately. The case is expected to be back in court in mid-April. Not guilty of murder. A jury has reached that verdict late last night at the murder trial of William Perkins. He's the man who was on trial for the April 2017 fatal shooting of 34-year-old Jonathan Ashford, the husband of Perkins' mistress. Perkins admitted to firing six shots, claiming self-defense. Prosecutors, however, called it murder, saying there was no evident evidence Ashford ever fired a weapon. However, the jury did find Perkins not guilty on a murder charge. He still faces a charge, though, of felon in possession. In the meantime, a man accused of robbing someone with a machete and pointing a gun at police officers now faces charges. 27-year-old Jacob Sacedo accused of robbing a person he knew at a home on South Geaver Street back on February 3rd. Officers were called to the house for a disturbance this week. Sacedo found in the backyard. Officers say he pointed a gun in their direction. Sacedo eventually dropped the weapon and was arrested. He now faces charges of attempted capital murder of a police officer and aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. San Antonio police looking for a group of burglars who tried stealing an ATM from Far West Side Bank last night. It happened sometime before four this morning at the Chase Bank on Pentraco Road near Loop 1604. Surveillance video shows three people yanking the machine off of its foundation using a pickup truck and then prying it open using a crowbar. It's unclear whether they got away with any money, but they did make a clean or semi-clean getaway. Police found the truck abandoned down the road as well as a sledgehammer and crowbar. The suspects have not been caught. Crime was among the top concerns for people who participated in the Barefax KSAT Rivard report poll. Now San Antonio police revealing the department averages more than a million calls for service per year. They range from neighbors bickering to rape and murder. The department asking for the public's help to reduce nonviolent crimes by being proactive. Simple measures like installing surveillance cameras and keeping doors locked can go a long way in allowing law enforcement to focus on stopping violence. Another thing is that we're seeing people that are leaving their keys and their key fobs inside of their vehicles, whether it be in the center console, in the glove box, and they're also making themselves an easy target. If you can reduce your chances of becoming a victim of a, of a car burglary and a car theft, you're also helping your police department as well. Our Devin Clark will dive deeper into the issue on the News at Six. All right, and a gray day over the Alamo City. A little bit of dampness out there as well, and definitely temperatures on the cool side. Now for this time of year, 51 degrees at the airport right now. So we had a few little light showers here and there, especially earlier this morning, and even some pockets of drizzle, but now not all that much out there. Nothing really on the radar screen that jumps out at you. Most of the accumulated rainfall was north of San Antonio and even east of town, a nice little sweet spot in Gonzales County and even parts of Guadalupe County where we had between about two tenths of an inch and almost half an inch. It's cool for the most part right around 50 and in the lower 50s. We'll be back to talk about a gusty day tomorrow, a cooler push of air, and when we'll see the sun again coming right up. Thank you, Adam. With two primary contests behind us, the Democratic candidates have been making their pitch to voters in Nevada. Voters there will hold their caucuses on Saturday. But tonight, it could be a critical tipping point for these White House hopefuls as they face off in a primetime debate before the nation. Nadia Romero is live in Las Vegas for us to break down what to expect next. Nadia. Well, Stephen Ursula, this is the first debate in a racially diverse state this primary season. Nevada has about a 29% Latino population. So this will be incredibly important for Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar, who are polling at 0 or 1% with voters of colors. And then, of course, there's Michael Bloomberg for the first time on the debate stage. I think we can win the Democratic nomination, and I'm absolutely certain we're going to defeat Donald Trump. 
Tonight, a showdown in Sin City with some candidates riding high. I am running to be the most progressive president we will have had in the last half century. Some candidates needing a jolt. 2020 is the fight of our lives. And one candidate coming from out of the blue. Well, thank you, everyone. The ninth Democratic presidential debate will be a critical test in this already dramatic primary season. On stage tonight, a new face, former mayor Michael Bloomberg, who has spent hundreds of millions of his own dollars to make his presence felt on the campaign trail. We know the con game Donald Trump plays. He's a one-trick pony. And I'm running to make sure he's a one-term president. His Democratic rivals have taken notice. Mayor Bloomberg and President Obama work together. Making him an obvious target. I don't think he has the right to buy this election. Tonight, a chance to change the narrative for Joe Biden, who hopes a more diverse vote in Nevada could help him crack the top three. The idea that we're going to decide a nomination before we've heard from all of those folks, all of you, is absolutely ridiculous. It's a key voting block Senator Amy Klobuchar is targeting as well. My story is this. Um, I stand on the shoulders of immigrants uh, myself. Um, I didn't come from money. Each candidate betting this debate will help them stake their claim to the silver state. Meanwhile, President Donald Trump is on a West Coast swing. He has three rallies and three days, and that includes Friday night right here in Vegas. Why? Well, it's the night before the Democratic caucuses that happen on Saturday, and he wants to get all the attention, all the focus back on him. Live from Vegas, I'm Nadia Romero. Steve, back to you. All right, Nadia, a lot of pressure on Michael Bloomberg tonight. First nationally televised debate. What do you think his strategy is tonight? Well, Michael Bloomberg has to stay the course and keep the focus on President Donald Trump. Right now, he's feeling a lot of pressure from all of his other Democratic challengers who have been attacking him. He's surging in the polls right now, even though he's not campaigning in the first four early voting states. So he has to come out of this debate unscathed with his focus on the president to move on to Super Tuesday. Steve? And that may be easier said than done. Nadia Romero in Las Vegas. Thank you, Nadia. Meantime, Bernie Sanders continuing his campaign trail in Texas this weekend, and he's stopping right here in San Antonio. The Democratic presidential candidate holding a rally at Cowboys Dance Hall on Saturday night. It's at 7 o'clock, but the doors open at 5 o'clock. The rally is free to attend, but you do have to RSVP. We have more information about how to go to the rally right now on KSAT.com.